Hello and welcome to The BAP. This is episode 56 for the 29th of May 2016. My name is Franco and joining me is Dean and Jason. We are broadcasting from the Progressive Throne. We're on this day in 1988. Is there anything progressive about a throne? Sorry to interrupt, (laughs) but is, is a monarchy really that progressive? Compared to... <laughs> something, <laughs> something even less, something even less fair. Despotism, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> well, the the closest thing you get to a progressive throne would be a benevolent dictatorship, I would imagine, like you have in Bhutan. Okay, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Touche, well, sir. <laughs> yep, well played, well played. You win. <laughs> um, as I was saying, on this day in 1988, U.S. President Ronald Reagan begins his first visit to the Soviet Union, where he arrives in Moscow for a superpower summit with the Soviet leader or better known to us in the West as the Great Satan, Mikhail Gorbachev. Batman was there as well, wasn't he, for the Superpower Summit? <laughs> Isn't that the DC Hall of Fame? Yeah, or League Justice of Justice? League, yeah. Yes. Douchebag filter. Um, I am continuing my journey with Battlestar Galactica, and they're experimenting with Jeebus. Yeah. yeah. Do, uh, does that yeah, persist? No, okay. Yes. How long does that, did they carry that through? Um, how, how long did you show go? Lots of yeah. Well, well, that's I didn't mind the spirituality aspect in Deep Space Nine, whereas I'm finding this a bit too jibbersy, like what um, Walking Dead did in season two. It's look, it's going to get worse before it gets better. (laughs) That's all we can tell you. It will. Yeah, it does get. Very, it becomes a major plot line for a there's while. There's a lot of stoicism. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of religion. <laughs> Look, with Deep, <laughs> with Deep Space Nine, I think the spirituality was well placed. It, it made All sense right. when if it was brought up. If you had to name the worst part of the season finale in Deep Space Nine, would it be the bullshit involving Galdacott returning as a Bajoran in the Wraith Caves down beneath Bajor? Does anyone care about that? <laughs> No one cared. There was space battles above Cardassia, all yeah. kinds of crazy stuff going on, and you have to watch this fucker. I think with I think, that Bajoran woman, he was nobbing. Just, <laughs> just, but just for a loved. moment, let's acknowledge the very specific and detailed um, memory of one particular episode that Dean has right there. But he I could do that with more, most of the episodes. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm almost but, certain um, of that. Yeah, look, it's just the, it was it was a shit plot, and it, it didn't wreck the finale, but it wrecked his character, right, Galdacott. One of the best characters on the show, Agreed. and then became the paper villain by the end. True. I must admit, I always found myself switching off during the religious oh, God, enlightenment I, I episodes, those episodes. Much like now. much like the uh, holodeck ones yeah. from. It's like, oh look, it's Kai Win <laughs> oh, next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, oh, we're just going to make shit up for an hour now. Yeah. Well, well, that's pretty much what the show is. Yeah. But I don't need to watch this episode. So. <laughs> Anyone else got douchebag filterage? I feel like I've just had some. So. <laughs> um. No, I think Overwatch actually. Yeah, we we talked about, about it last week, didn't we? That was that was. I don't know, we talked about it last week, but well, we won't talk about it during the. We beta. mentioned it. I mean, it was an, it's an, an interesting thing because it's it's kind of a a massive release. So Overwatch is the latest game from Blizzard, which is a little bit like Team Fortress, and I know Dean's been getting into it. I have, and I haven't been playing it. However, I've noticed the impact of this show, of this game turning up on the sort of. There are people on my Facebook feed, many people. Yeah. And it's just like over, like bit, like play of the day kills and stuff they're getting like it's nuts. Yeah, I didn't even know all my friends played this game. It, it's bonkers. It looks like a great game, and and it's I think uh, the the way it was released and the fact that something like ten million people tried it during the open beta, which is just an unheard of amount of people during a, a beta phase. Okay, so, so for the uninitiated like myself, what is Overwatch? It's uh, a first person shooter, teams of six <coughs> versus a team of six, and you pick one of uh, I think it's twenty one people in the roster. That fit into four roles. You've got attackers, defenders, tanks, and supports. And you have to build a team out of these guys, and then you pit your team against the opposition's team, competing for objectives. And, and however, unlike other first-person shooters like the Counter Strikes and all these kind of things that you and I just get our asses owned in every moment, these sorts of games, not like Team Fortress, that have characters that you can play that aren't so Twitch required. That well, you don't need to be super. And again, you're, you're and, playing for an objective, so getting killed or killing people often doesn't help. The number yeah, of times yeah. I've played and won games just because the little COD kids are running around shooting each other in the head over there while <laughs> the big kids actually win the map. Yeah. It's, it's kind of fun to have that happen. You're like, what, no one's yeah. defending the objective? Oh, well, we'll just, uh, we win. <laughs> so, so it's once again, Blizzard doing something they do so well is make a game very accessible. Okay. Like make a genre extremely accessible to a wide range of people sort of thing and, and new, new gamers and stuff. What about it's very pretty as well accessibility? Yeah, yeah. Can you play it on an iPad, for instance? No. 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 no you wouldn't be able no. to play that on an iPad. It's, can... it's console and PC. Yeah, PCs, consoles, Macs, that kind of thing. You must be able to get on Mac, surely. Yeah, I think yeah. you can. I don't mm. think there's any cross-platform 
platformness about it though. If you play on PlayStation, you can't play with your Xbox mates. Are you sure? PC because they're no, logging I'm really in. Not sure. If you, you because because BattleNet is like you log in through a BattleNet client on the PC, and mm-hmm. as far as I kn- you don't need a BattleNet account on PlayStation. You can link it to your BattleNet account, but you don't have to have one. Okay, so then it, you're right. I think that's just for your rewards. You're right. It might actually be. It might be console specific, so you have to. You're playing against yeah, right. other people. It would be a little unfair playing against someone with a mouse and keyboard when you're using a little direction pad thing. Yeah, I'm terrible with those D pads. Well. Anyway, great game. I can't wait to try it myself. Yeah, you should. It's good fun. Yeah. You make a great gorilla, Winston. So could I play you guys with my Mac against you, PC? Well, no, that's console? what we were just saying. Just Mac saying. versus PC is usually cool. Mm-hmm. But but Mac... But, but versus PlayStation. Not he'll cool. be on his PlayStation. If I play it, I'll probably be on a PlayStation as well. Something like I see. That. By the way, we are in no way funded by Sony, but if they want <laughs> to get in contact with us about plugging their products on the show, we are more than willing to accept freebies. Radio, short, fast news time. And that's probably the first time I've actually said that correctly. Without <laughs> us having to come back and do an edit. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lint Siege news. So um, for those who aren't familiar... On it's not fi- under siege again, is it? No. Is Steven Seagal involved? No. <laughs> <laughs> Although that would make an interesting movie. I- I'd watch that to see an aged Steven Seagal go back to under siege again. Um, for those not familiar with the Lint Siege, on the 15th to 16th of December 2014, a lone gunman... Man Haran Monis held hostage 10 customers and 8 employees of a Lint Chocolate Cafe located in Martin Place in Sydney, Australia. Police treated the event as a terrorist attack at the time, but Monis's motives have subsequently uh, been debated. So, um, currently there's an inquest being conducted with regards to the events that took place on, that, on the days of the siege. And testimony has come out from lead police negotiator, Reg. So, Is that the only name he's given? Yes, he's... Um, Hi, I'm Reg and I'm the lead police negotiator. I think that's What's the, your last name? Don't worry about that. You don't <laughs> need to know it. You can trust me, I'm Reg. <laughs> can we speak to Reg, please? Yeah, I'm just a regular guy. <laughs> so, I mean, an inquest of this sort of thing doesn't usually draw my quest, uh, sorry, my interest, but uh, what did draw my attention was some of the headlines some of the newspapers had been running. So, um, we have the Australian headline of Lint Cafe Siege Inquest Negotiator had just four weeks terror training. Um, SBS also chimed in with that same uh, headline. However, we did have the Sydney Morning Herald with Link Cafe Siege, police negotiator underestimated danger of man manus. So what interested me particularly about this is, you know, on the one hand, yes, it is a bit disturbing that um, some of our more senior um, negotiators haven't had um, sufficient training in dealing with terrorists. However, trying to purport that the Lynch siege was a terrorist attack is what has me concerned yeah. because it's, it's come about and I think most people agree that um, Manus was a very disturbed individual. Yeah, he and was... And, uh, sorry, there was one other headline that came up on this subject which supports your sort of idea there. That's um, anonymous uh, Defence Force personnel were saying how they would have done it so differently and the, and the, the local police completely botched the job. Anonymous defence force personnel, of course, <laughs> and these were this, these were quotes that were just given. To, I think it was in um, one of the major newspapers or something like that as well. And how much terror training do we think our negotiators should have, considering how many terror incidents we have in Australia, which is fuck all? How much training do they need to deal with that? I mean, we're going to put all of them through training on the off chance that one day they're going to have four weeks well, training is actually not bad. Like if I got plus, plus training, I mean, I'd be pretty good. The at fact something. that he's just simply a mentally unbalanced individual. And they and have not a they have yeah. they have training for that kind of thing. Well, yeah. that, that's a, yeah. that's the important point that yeah. that's an irrelevant point for the Lint Siege Cafe yeah. where terrorist training wouldn't have helped deal with a with a crazy man. That's right. That's right. I, look, I, what are your I demands? I I don't have I any chocolate. Man. You must end all chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is where I get annoyed with mainstream media who purport falsehoods repeatedly, which are easily. You know, yeah. with a little Google search. When does that? And it, I suppose well, it's pretty uh, frank. These people have had less than four weeks training in their jobs. You can't expect them to understand a Google search. <laughs> they've, they've fired all the experienced journalists now. They're just left with the interns. But How I mean, you doing, Greg? <laughs> which is thankfully why we have a job as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can understand why the Australian runs with this sort of headline. You know, fear mongering is their bag. Yeah, SBS to chime in on it. But SBS has done some weird things like that as well. They're not quite the objective news source that, that they once were. I enjoy their satirical newspaper. Yes. I, I've, I've become quite a fan of SBS on that, in that regard, but that's the only part of their news yeah. I read. But their, their, their standard news has become exactly that, pretty standard mm. these days. 
So I got a funny one. It's not quite as funny as a terrorist with a chocolate shop. But um, former Australian <laughs> Idol host James Matheson, which uh, that's actually not funny yeah, at all. People died, Dean. Mind. People died. Hey, <laughs> you're laughing about it. Um, <laughs> you're a terrible Australian, Jason. Uh, former Australian Idol host James Matheson has just announced his candidacy for the federal seat of Warringah, a seat currently held by golden year man himself, our former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Uh, Matheson has been targeting the youth vote by using a hashtag, Time's Up Tony, uh, to try and get people to vote for him. Uh, and he's seeking to challenge him on issues of climate change, same-sex marriage, and offshore detention. He's running as an independent, and his reasoning for this shows a good deal of self-reflection. He's noted that Warringah is traditionally a liberal seat. The people there would never vote Labour, and they find the Greens to be too extreme for their tastes. So he's seeking to break up the party structures, listen to the voices of the electorate, and bring everyone along, and get rid of Tony. Which I think is a good thing. Malcolm Turnbull would be on board. Malcolm would probably come around and help, you know, poll with the guy. Um, tonight's tonight's friend of the show, Bill Shorten, was quite happy to go the I'm not Tony route for a long time as well. So why shouldn't it work for the guy going directly against him in his own seat? Yeah, yeah. Hashtag I'm not Tony. I'm not Tony. That would be just good for anyone, though. <laughs> when you're trying to like, vote for me because I'm not Tony Abbott. But Dean, you're not even standing for... Do you want everything else left the same, but me not being Tony? (laughs) I'm your man. Yeah, that's what Malcolm's doing. (laughs) Will my opponent agree with me that being not Tony is a good thing? (laughs) Can you commit to that? I think we're crossing right over into... bipartisan support to both not being Tony. Have we crossed into debate coverage now? Is that what we're doing? (laughs) I've got one more little short one. I think we 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 should continue on with the short fast news before we break (laughs) out into debate. That's fine, but... uh, Let's go. All right, uh, so one more from me. I'm just going to push in because you pointed at me. Um, we talked about last week the, the AFP's plan. raids on um, Stephen Conroy's house, and I want to do a little bit of an update on that because I thought this was genius. Uh, Stephen Conroy has now formally claimed parliamentary privilege over the documents seized from his house and his aide's house. Choice piece about this is it means that the documents now must be sealed and held in possession of the Senate clerk until such a time as the Senate can make a decision as to the privilege applying or not. And the reason this is genius is because they're not sitting until after the election. Because <laughs> Turnbull disbanded both houses. <laughs> okay, so the AFP have the documents. That they can't ha- look at them. And they're not allowed to look at them. And in fact, they have to give them to the clerk. I mean, to be fair... They have to give them to the clerk who's on holiday at the moment. Yeah, to be fair, they did take photos of a lot of documents and then disseminate them throughout the NBN company. So they probably got pictures of the cover pages or something out there. But That, sound, uh, that sounds like whistleblower activity to me. They well, they're going to get arrested for that. We'll make sure we raid their houses. Yeah. Chuck them in the van, Tony. It's pretty selective over who they're going to who they're going to charge over, over careless carelessly leaving these documents out and stuff mm. like that. Mm. Um, I have douchebag news. Andrew Hasty, federal Manning, a member for Canning, has refused to stop using photos of himself in uniform in campaign material. The Defence Department has written to Mr. Hasty asking him to drop military images from roadside banners and flyers amid concerns over the perceived politicisation of the Australian Defence Force. But Andrew, no, he doesn't see there's a conflict of interest. He can't see the Department of Defence's very fair and sensible position of there has to be some sort of semblance of separation between the military Hang and on the a government. Minute. Why don't they just make it a fucking order? I'm swearing a lot today. Why don't they just, no, but just make it an order. He's a soldier. Get what, a general to call him up. He'll be like, um, Lieutenant Hasty, just, just, this is a direct order. Stop putting photos of yourself up in uniform. Sir, yes, yeah, sir, sir. Done. Problem solved. Well, he's retired. He's only a reservist at the moment. So he could face um, possible sanction as what, a reservist. What would that but mean? What would that mean? I don't know. Sanctions. But I mean, what roof. an idiot. How, can't he see why... I mean, I know why he wants to do yeah, it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> he wants yeah. to tap into the, you know, the Australian The nationalist psyche. Australian. Yeah, yeah. He loves someone in uniform and not <laughs> in the But I mean, we way. also love a bit of a rebel. And no one and loves... And he's rebelling no. against the man as well. So now he's like appealing to the men in uniform crowd. He's appealing to the nationalists. Now he's appealing to the rebel crowd. They're like, go look at him. He's not obeying an order. Mm. He's got it all going on. We should vote for this. Hashtag, he's not Tony, by the way. True. <laughs> Although he's almost seemingly like Tony. He is. And I think Tony campaigned with him from yeah, memory as well. He did. So. He did come over here. It, it seemed like he was moderately more intelligent at one stage, but he seemed that... Hasty or Tony? Hasty. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure there, buddy, because... Uh, is it hard to tell? I mean, it's, it is becoming harder <laughs> to tell now. That's, I think that's the problem. Yeah. I'm, I'm mentioning about Tony Abbott. He was in um, our fair state um, on Thursday. I actually tried to go and see him. Oh, really? I just couldn't make it what, work. I couldn't find doing? specific details. Uh, I think he went to campaign in uh, Canning and also came to Melville Way. Went to a bowls well, club. Canning is Hasty's uh, yeah. territory. So. so I was hoping I could actually just see the buffoon in the flesh. I find him interesting. There was he, On the campaign trail, Tony seems to actually be more appealing than he is when he's actually in office. 
Like he seems to actually have no problem with rolling up his sleeves, getting out there and meeting people. Mm. Whereas other politicians, they do, you know, they, Malcolm comes out here and does a couple of press conferences, doesn't really bother to do the, the, the grassroots campaign stuff, which Tony does. And I, I kind of like that. Mm. I just hate the man. Mm. I have one more bit of douchebag news. Yes. Do it. I just, just your announcement of douchebag news reminded me of it. Can we name the one most hated person in the world that could possibly uh, endorse, who just uh, endorse spoke Donald Trump? Trump. Trump. Yep. You know who it is, don't I you? Do. Yeah. Martin Shkreli. Shkreli's back. <laughs> He obviously hadn't been in the news long enough. With a series of tweets as well. It's like four <laughs> tweets before he finally got to the point yeah. of I endorse Donald Trump. It's crazy. I've isn't got it? no idea why he thinks he's important enough to endorse anyone. He is important enough. If Donald Trump is important enough and serious enough to be president, Martin Shkreli is important enough to endorse him. Maybe he'd be VP. <laughs> That's, I think he was talking about the VP, actually, as the <laughs> VP. They should pick someone. That, well, I but, mean, it makes sense, though, he would uh, support Donald Trump. I mean, he is the student of unfettered capitalism. Yeah. So. The art of the deal sounds very much like his reading. The art of Shkreli. <laughs> the art of Shkreli. Let's um, make a Shkreli. So another interesting thing that happened this week was that Malcolm Turnbull, after a two-year absence off of Alan Jones's talk show, fronted up and had a chat with Alan. The last time they met, they got into a verbal uh, disagreement about who was or was not throwing bombs after Malcolm would not say categorically that he stood behind Joe Hockey and Tony Abbott. And then we all know he did with an axe. <laughs> but he didn't want to say that on air. But he was back. And interestingly enough, uh, Alan Jones was uh, pretty much towing the party line. He was he doing was what he could. He was very cordial. He was. He, he gave uh, the Prime Minister a nice welcome. They had a bit of a chat about uh, the Safe Schools, the Safe Schools program. They had a chat about that and how it was not necessarily appropriate for 15 year olds to be role playing. Uh, and they had a chat around uh, the super. And. Uh, Alan wanted Tony, uh, Tony wanted Malcolm, sorry, it's easy and confused, <laughs> easy and confused. Alan wanted Malcolm to uh, maybe admit that they would be rethinking about that $1.6 million super target, and uh, he said no. He then wow. pointed out, which I thought he did quite well, and he has not done since, that look, it's $1.6 million tax-free, and after that, it's only 15%, which is lower, I would like to point out, than every other tax bracket you might otherwise be in. And yet, absolutely, absolutely. liberal voters everywhere are up in arms about this. I, I we'll, think American we'll, multinational companies would like to park their uh, profits in our generous super yeah, valuation yeah. schemes. But I mean, and as we as we mentioned when this came up during the debate, and I guess we're sliding into debate coverage now. Hey, you're the one sliding. We, we might as well. <laughs> <laughs> There's the, um, the to, from our perspective, that that's fine. But from the perspective of someone who's invested a lot of money in superannuation, you're changing the rules on them. Yeah, it is, it, is, it is an awkward making it. Which is, which is probably one of Bill Shorten's finest moments in tonight's debate was when he pointed that out. And, and he would and never, ever, ever make, make a retrospective. Make it retro, retrospective. And I think that's, that could win him some votes. That could, uh, I reckon my, my parents would have to reevaluate their hard right leanings. I think it's interesting. <laughs> and he's right, you know, like retrospective laws are just not cool. Yeah. Just not cool. Even it, negative it's, gearing, getting rid of that retrospect, um, and they, without they going retrospective that, would yeah. be fine. Which is, it's interesting he can point to the difference there. He's like, well, look, we've both got different solutions to this particular budget hole problem, but mine's not retrospective. It makes you wonder why Malcolm Turnbull would be holding on so tightly to that not make, just simply, let's not make it retrospective. I think because the budget doesn't hang together if they don't. They need that 15% tax. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's just a guess on But I mean, part. they fudge figures so hard. Why, why wouldn't they simply do Much that? Much harder. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to frame tonight's debate, we had... Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull fronting up in a red in a very, tie, a very spiffy, well tailored suit with mm. a elegant red tie. It was like a red and with a pink sort of stripe through it. A bit of salmon going on, mm. a bit salmon. of a trick to the eye. Bill Shorten also red tie, but an ill fitting suit. Traditionally, red ties have, 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 have I always associate those with Labour for some reason. Maybe there's red ties, well, red coalition generally the Labour movement and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Malcolm Usually. was making it uh, fast and sweet with hand gestures. Looking very well posed when he was giving his speeches. Whereas we had the puppet, Bill Shorten, <laughs> had a bit of a boogie going on whenever he was talking. Yeah, he was I, more I head, thought it was... Well, he was more head mobile than... He was definitely head mobile. <laughs> I thought it was weird. Malcolm Turnbull's opening statement was basically big ups to China. You know, like he, he came on stage after... Bill won a coin toss and then he immediately let Malcolm speak first, which I thought was really odd. Uh, but anyway, and then Malcolm comes on stage. He's like, you know, China's a growing economy. 40 years ago, they were nothing. Now, you know, they're our neighbours. They're going to have a massive percent of uh, middle class incomes soon. And I thought it was interesting. It's like, oh man, maybe China are watching this. They're interested to see 
what their boy didn't mention the fact that we're allowing the Americans to base their boats here while they challenge the Chinese to their Spratly Sea Islands and stuff like that as well. The other thing I found with Malcolm was I felt with his opening speech he made very concise points, very clear and articulate, almost labour points. Though he was saying we want um, high wages. Mm. and education for children I was going hold on that doesn't sound like uh, the coalition's policy but it was very clear and concise about what his liberal government was going to be standing for whereas I felt Bill's opening speech was a bit waffly I couldn't quite un- I think Bill got started off quite weak and got stronger as time yes. went on yeah. Def- oh most definitely but I, I thought I particularly like Malcolm's uh, opening statement where he said a strong economy isn't just about money it's about opportunities for everyday Australians the better off the nation's economy is the more opportunities there are for your kids now of course in a way he's kind of talking about trickle down economics you know if we give big tax cuts to companies then you know there'll be more jobs for your kids which may or may not actually work but i like the way he framed it yes so the first question was about trust i believe actually uh, we'll go back that tri- trickle down economics the fact that it doesn't work i know the, it doesn't the fa- work. but the fact that they can still think they can peddle it and people are still but he, go- he peddled it elegantly i mean yeah. it, it was a lie but he peddled it well plus i mean we're talking about opportunities and of course our our pet sort of hate of his is his clobbering the nbn which that was an opportunity-making device. That was meant to be an opportunity-making device. Well, I mean, if you policy. watch Q&A, you would see that Christopher Pine says it's a movie-watching device. <laughs> and eventually, at the height, people will be able to watch five I agree movies with Christopher Pine. It is a movie-watching device. And I, I resent the fact that I can't watch movies in HD at the moment. Yeah, look, I mean, it's not about the economy. It's about streaming Netflix to five devices in your house at once. Exactly. And I highly doubt I could do that, to be honest, <laughs> at the moment. So Wait, look, we're talking standard def... You remember what uh, real media looked like? Those kind of blocky things you get? <laughs> Five of those. Look, I'm a hardcore YouTube subscriber and I get 240p most poems. That's pretty that's, fucking that's sad. That's not great. That's not great. <laughs> that's, that's, sad. Sad. that's sad. I am on the NBN uh, and I get you shut, up. shut up. So the first question was about trust, about, uh, well, in, in, a, in a matter of, like we had Lara, Laura, Laura Tingle. Laura, um, Laura Tingle. Asking both candidates to explain to the audience who they were. So she went first with Malcolm Turnbull saying that he uh, he was brought into government to move the party back to a more centre position, but it seems that he's gone on with the previous Prime Minister's policies. She was asking much. him to differentiate himself from Tony Abbott. And yes, he... and he refused to answer the question directly. He tried to latch on to a side aspect about... Um, spelling of their change. names, I believe. Spelling of their <laughs> names. It's quite different. He went on a long... Pre- he did mention his wife Lucy a lot as well. Don't yes. forget. Like well, that's because Tony's wife isn't Lucy. So that's there's true. A difference. Hashtag she's not Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, I'm home. <laughs> I just wonder if he does any Ricky Ricardo voices. It would really make me happy. <laughs> I wish I could do one that was better than that. <laughs> so he, he wasn't really able to address that answer and, and Bill in turn really didn't provide a compelling answer to that one. I mean, maybe a bit... He, he, at the end of his waffle, he did directly give... So, uh, he suggested that he did answer the question. I, I like... Bill made a point where he said that the um, coalition was essentially giving a $50 billion gift to businesses that was going to have no more than a 0.1% effect on GDP according to Treasury's own modelling. So essentially, Turnbull was taking a big risk with our economy because he was believing it was going to have more of an effect than Treasury did. And then he likened him to Thatcher and Reagan, which I thought was quite nice. But I feel like that would have resonated positively amongst right-wing voters. Might do. People are like, yeah. yeah, Reagan. I think it's too clever an analog- well, reference for the mainstream public. Yeah, that, it, public that bit really, worried me. I was like, yeah. ah, you were, you were on point. And then Thatcher and Reagan. Why did you mention Reagan I, I last? Think you, you probably want a more domestic reference. He's, yeah, when, he's, when he talks about them, he's only going to be preaching to the choir kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. that's only going to resonate with the right. But I mean, uh, obviously his mission for the whole debate was to keep on hammering home the $50 billion tax cut for big corporations because he went on that ad nauseum throughout the whole debate. But obviously that's an important platform issue for Labor. Yeah, I also like the way that Laura Tingle landed a point where he basically did not answer her question at all about what he stood for and how he changed over time. I thought that she was far more eloquent than Bill Shorten and I was kind of wishing that she would have been up there in the debate. Maybe we could have a third candidate... Or just get rid of one of them. I don't really care about either. Look, of seriously, team. Laura Tinker for PM. Why not? Ha- hashtag I'm with Laura. <laughs> <laughs> she could do a better job than either of those. Yeah, two. the bit that shat me about Malcolm because when he finally did talk about uh, climate change, when she got him to talk about his uh, reversal of policy, he just went to the global action thing. You know, yeah. my personal beliefs haven't changed. I still believe it's. A but great Australia's crisis, not going to do anything till everyone, do anything else, till everyone so, else is doing anything. Yeah. Didn't mention that everyone's already doing something yeah. right now, and that we've committed to some of the least aggressive targets. In the history we've of taken, We've taken the least aggressive targets and failed to meet, to meet yeah, them. Yeah, like you didn't mention any of that. 
I mean, but, in terms of um, speaking to his base, that was the dog whistle. So basically, the, uh, you know, the liberal voters in general are very apathetic towards climate change. So, you know, that's a nice uh, giveaway for them saying, we're only going to do whatever the rest of the world's doing, which is not much. Yeah. My favourite uh, Bill Shorten line of the early part of the debate was after Malcolm spoke about climate change. And then Bill just sort of smiled. He was like, you know, 10 months ago, I thought this job was going to be a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that, and he finished off that zinger with, and then I got t- um, Turnbull Light or was yeah, Abbott Light. Abbott Light. <laughs> I was like, that, that's pretty good. That, yeah. that was a nice Bill Shaw. I didn't see him as a very funny guy. Uh, I still kind of don't, but he actually landed a few zingers that seemed to be off the cuff. It didn't yeah. seem to be like someone had written down a bunch of jokes where he would just robotically blurt them out. It's because he's a bit uncomfortable with himself that, you know, those zingers just don't really it's land as well as they could. He d- doesn't really have suit, comic so timing, does yeah. he? But, but he, he produced some good lines. He just doesn't have the timing of it, true. No. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting, again, where he stung them on the thought bubbles. So he pointed out that uh, the coalition first, they, they flowed the idea of a 15% GST and then they disagreed about that publicly and then Malcolm personally floated the idea about the, the states maybe having their own income tax and then that got cut down by the states and now they're talking about tax cuts to businesses and I thought Bill made a good point where he's like how do you know like third time's a charm is it how do you yeah. know they're going to stick with this one and is it the end will they want to change it later who knows yeah who knows I mean is there going to be a fourth plan do they have any plan is it just off the cuff are they going to get one plan accepted by the majority of Australian politicians <laughs> no. It also seemed that Malcolm was a bit more uneasy moving away from the standard platforms he wasn't wasn't so willing to be off the cuff, whereas I found with Bill, he would spit out, you know, the, the preamble that he would, would need, you know, $50 billion to be corporations, but then he would, you know, ad lib to some yeah. extent. Um, yeah, where he sort of addressed the idea of removing subsidies from, from the buildings, from the, from the corporations, instead of just having tax cuts to corporations and mm-hmm. things like that, so yeah. raising revenue that way, yeah. My, uh, my favourite Laura Tinkle moment was uh, during that trust question where she's like, you know, how can we trust... Either of you, uh, Malcolm, you oversaw the deposing of one prime minister and Bill, you oversaw the deposing of two. <laughs> and he, he did come out and say, I mean, he, he did the mea culpa. He said, yes, we've, we've learned our lesson. We yeah. won't be doing that again. I, I think well, I mean, he's going to hope that, isn't he? Because he's <laughs> yeah, the leader now. That's right. Like, you, you all out there, you all you ladies, you've all learned your lesson learned now. Right? Our lesson, right? Bill's in charge, so <laughs> we've all learned our lesson. Look at me. Look at me. Uh, to be honest, I don't, as well as I was saying before, I don't think either politician really went out at that question the way they should have. I mean, it's it's almost a gotcha question because there's no there's no right answer to sort of say, oh, I've learned, you can trust me, it won't happen again. That's just not going to f- fly with anyone. And as I was saying, I always felt that probably you'd need to go on the attack with that question and say, well, times have changed. Politics are a lot more cutthroat now. Things are changing a lot faster than they did in the past. And Party politics are such that you might get a different leader mid during a during an administration, yeah, yeah. this is yeah, the way it is. I, you know, you go, I will fight to make sure you get c- a continuity with change. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But you know, um, you, you want to suggest you will do your utmost to bring, um, you know, a consistency to the leadership. So rather than getting brought drawn into, you can trust me. Change it to, you know, change the dynamic of the question. Yeah, yeah. I I think Malcolm should go on the attack then, and I, I actually done the whole. Does anyone out there honestly think I should have left Tony in charge? Like, <laughs> yeah. just does anyone? Because I don't. Because uh, the thing about the no, uh, the could, difference he, between the coalition, he, he, there's obviously there's obviously a faction within the party that he has to I know but pander to and t- coming Australia, out and saying something like that. The, audience, the Australian people wanted Tony gone. They did not want Kevin gone, and then they but, did not but really as, want and Julia Bill gone. Shorten pointed this out. He doesn't. Um, Bill Shorten leads his party. Yeah, yeah. The Liberal Malcolm Party leads by, Malcolm Temple. Yeah. That's why he couldn't say that kind of thing. Yeah. Which was it which was another zinger. Another from good Bill. zinger, yeah. Yeah. So we also had a the inevitable question about stopping the boats, where each uh, candidate went you know, was stumbling over themselves to stop the boats. And the best line went to Laura Tingle. Once again. <laughs> <laughs> why what did she say? Let's step away to a subject where you can both differentiate yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. So that was great, it was yeah. almost ridiculous that the um, that the host allowed them to ramble on so much, agreeing with each other. I actually thought it was more policy. ridiculous when Turnbull tried to mansplain to Tingle. Oh yes, that's like right. He, he just yeah. took his he took his time. He's like, let me just break it down for you. That was like, <laughs> he, he almost said, "Darling or princess." I'm not sure he's going. Yeah, like, <laughs> like it was just like it was it was almost cringeworthy. I was like, "Oh, Malcolm, what are you doing?" And then I remembered he entered politics when he was 50. So you know. 
obviously he's been running his own business for a long time in Australia. There's probably a certain mindset. There's probably a certain amount of mindset that comes with that. A, a Trumpesque mindset. Yeah, so I, it was. It was. Bill didn't make those issues, and Bill actually underscored a few times how uh, his party was one for making sure that women got treated the same as men. And I was, I was like, is he making reference to Malcolm there earlier? Or is he like just as a general policy thing, or was it also like a subtle nudge to the? Uh, the oh, no, I there? think it's. I think that's a. It's a good line to go with um, for Labor because oh, it's a great. It's, line it, I mean, the Liberal Party is well known to be a bit of a boys' club. I mean, you've got Julie Bishop, and it, was it? There's only two She's in the cabinet now. Man. Well, it's just that there's not. They're massively underrepresented. I mean, if you, if you yeah. got in a fight with Julie Bishop, I'm back in Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> She will rip you to pieces. I'm not. I'm not showing up to the fight. <laughs> yeah, if she wants me to buy the bike shed, I ain't gonna be there. Uh. Uh-uh. They also had a uh, question about a direct question about climate change, and we uh, Malcolm Turnbull reiterated basically the government's approach would be whatever the rest of the world would do, we would we would follow would. suit eventually. Yes. Yeah. Whereas I think. Um, Bill, on a difficult uh, question to stress with the Australian public, I still think there's a lot of apathy towards making a voting decision based on climate change. And I think Bill made some really elegant points on a really difficult subject to connect with mainstream Australia in terms of yeah. you know, it being about our, our future, uh, children's future. Yeah, not lumping the kids with the problem. No. And also pointing out to Malcolm that there's a significant cost to doing nothing. Yes. Which is to that save was, the planet. That was good, yeah. He, he, he could have really drummed that one a bit more though. Like, yeah, but... He, he, he brought it up and he made it reasonably forcefully, but you're right, he could have come back to it. Um, the fact that Malcolm Turnbull was saying there's a cost to doing anything about climate change and he was saying there's a cost to doing nothing. I thought it was interesting as well when Malcolm was talking about how they were going to put science central to all of their yes. policy decisions. Like, nice, oh, because you've nice cut the CSO. Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the only point I felt that Malcolm Turnbull won on the debate was, and I mean, I don't like to use the word one actually because it sort of uh, signifies some intellect into what he did. But he's, a there smart, was no, he's a smart It was guy. basically okay, him hammering Labor over um, Kevin Rudd letting the boats back in. Yeah. And yeah. at the end of the day, he, he's won on that well, point because that will resonate with Australia. They will make decisions abs- based on that. And, and Labor Party have painted themselves into that corner over years and years and years and in decades, in fact, yeah. by not taking the moral high ground at all with that kind of thing and just going along and following the same policy. So they're, they're, it's absolutely right. And they can they can cloud the field by saying, even though the boats never really stopped, there's that perception within the within the community that they could say, oh, look, they stopped turning up on our shores. We ended up shipping them over to other places. But, yeah. And no one's going to bother drawing that, uh, drawing that differential. So... He's right, he can make that line and, and Labor just has to eat it up because they have been completely complicit. But from a strategic it point of view... It bugs me though, you know, because like, it's not like the refugees have stopped. It's not like they're not going anywhere. It's not like you've yeah. stopped the wars and saved people's lives. All you've done is stop treating people humanely and giving them shelter. What you're basically saying is, I'm a monumental piece of shit. Vote yeah, and it's something that's come up when um, when you talk to, to activists. They keep pushing this party line, this line that... That the conditions in the de- in the uh, destination nation will drive up refugees in in these other nations, when in fact they can, they can show the the uh, map of uh, the graph of uh, refugee people in in sort of movement, and it completely coincides with the activities within the countries from which they're coming. Yeah. It's like there's a massive war in Syria. Hence, everybody's trying to leave. Get out of Syria, it has yeah. nothing to do with hey, I hear Australia is pretty lenient on on hey, these refugees. How about becoming an economic migrant? Honey? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but it was even there was even a problem with the framing of the question. So it was um, the Herald Sun's journalist. So basically, um, she went on to explain there was a period where the X amount of um, overseas interned refugees were apportioned out to third um, countries. You know, sixteen hundred remaining. Can you guarantee now that they won't be repatriated to Australia? So even the way the question's framed, it's like, hold on, they don't have any right to seek refugee status in Australia. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. pretty insidious. Well, and Malcolm Turnbull question. question. I think what they were saying, the Herald Sun was saying, last time we had this many refugees in detention, the only way we got out of this was because Canada took some, New Zealand took some. And, and they're no longer going to do and that. They're yet. not going to do but that. But she anymore. wasn't talking about the ethics of what we did. She no, then no. went on to say, "And can you guarantee we won't be taking the sixteen hundred? I now? didn't catch. I didn't catch yeah. Shorten's answer because Malcolm Turnbull categorically said no. They yeah, will not Malcolm be coming said to Australia. Flat out no. And I didn't catch what and Shorten we said about it. talked over the top of Shorten. Did we? <laughs> <laughs> Shit. My most, notes don't uh, include what Shorten <laughs> said on that either. Mo- most of what I recall of Bill Shorten was basically trying to neuter. Um, Turnbull's point so basically yeah. he, he went on the waffle about we, we're going to stop the people smugglers people, people smugglers getting back into business we're going to stop the drownings at sea yeah, yeah. whoever forms a government there'll be no changes is, is what Shorten opened his statement with 
and I have no notes further to that. I did find it was interesting. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull then went on to say that people smugglers market on social media, uh, and what they're saying is that the ANC get back in power. It's game on. You just can't trust Labor. And then Shorten immediately called Turnbull out. He's like, shame on you, Malcolm, for what you've just said. If they're watching everything we're saying, <laughs> yeah, that's right. you've just helped the people smugglers. And I was like, damn, that's a good line. <laughs> See, and that was off the cuff. I mean, there's no way he could have prepared for quite for that one. Well, it, it was maybe magical. in general. But well, maybe they had like a strategy. If he attacks you on this, bang. Yeah. But it was, it was well, it was well done. There's a complicity between um, the media and our politicians that the one question I would have liked to seen um, posed was definitely never going to be posed, even by Laura Tingle, which I believe was, um, there's an increasing objection to the way refugees are being treated in our um, off offshore processing plants, um, not only domestically, but criticisms internationally. What are you going to do to address this? That question wasn't put forward. Yeah, it's true. That is true. Not I mean, we've had, have we've they, had two people set themselves on fire. Have they and faced those type of questions before and they simply say, look, this is a matter for the on-site management. We don't have any control. I'm pretty sure they've tried. They've gone that line before. Hey, we outsourced it. Yeah. What are we no, do, right? exactly, that's exactly but what they it's do. It's so easy to pick apart because then you go, well, how come you were, you're in an arrangement for countries which won't allow free journalists to travel? You're right, there? because then this is where the journalists, uh, journalists become complicit because they don't follow up on that kind of thing. They, they've allowed that other answer at that time. I wonder how much sort of uh, oversight the leaders have before they come on the show like maybe they're like we're not going to talk about this but I can't imagine they would I'm just, I'm just curious because I think because both of them are in agreement as to what they're going to say about refugees maybe they'll just like there's no point asking questions because they'll be like, I, I, I suspect, I'm doing what Malcolm says I suspect they have a, probably an idea of what he, of the subject matter of each question maybe not the exact question but the subject matter yeah um I know there's, there were so many debates in the US elections and, and each debate had its own sets of rules and sometimes I think they knew all the questions up front, sometimes they didn't. So yeah, yeah. I don't know how they manage it here. Um, this, I'd be interested in finding this out. This is shorter and more concise than... Since I was a little bit worried there was going to be even more waffle, but... Most of the questions allow them to put their platform forward rather than the actual any real... And they pivoted to their platform yeah. so they often. They so just... did. Every time Malcolm had to answer a question, it's the economy, stupid. Every time Bill Shorten did... Education, health, no cut to Medicare. Every time it was like, "How are you different from Tony Abbott?" That's exactly yeah. right. He pivoted over to their to their platform. And most of the most of the the probing questions or critical questions were subjectively based. I mean, you know, no real fact based questions to really you know get at them. Yeah, yeah. The the only one I quite liked was the climate change conversation we, we talked about. That was the only one where they were like, you know, can you explain your platform going forwards and they both actually had the opportunity to explain a genuine point of difference between the two parties so it'll be interesting if they've got more debates how many more weeks till the election? five weeks five weeks to go five weeks and i hope we're gonna have some more debates because if that was just an opening opening round and they can start building on those question lists so that they have to get into a little bit more depth i don't know that we might see some something more interesting out of it this really was them just getting up and speechifying yeah, hour, and so. I mean, it was with um, our Australian public broadcaster, so they have to have a bit of a light touch to mm. have not the perception of bias. <laughs> I quite liked uh, Bill Short or journalism three word uh, <laughs> slogan of growth with fairness. Yes. That was up there with continuity with change <laughs> for me, and the word trust <laughs> yeah. was everywhere. Trust Labor a lot. Keep trusting them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was an interesting debate. It was an interesting debate. I, I I liked at the end. Shorten brought up the NBN after Malcolm couldn't so talk anymore. He brought up, you know, putting science in the centre after Malcolm couldn't talk anymore. And he brought up the public transport projects that they're talking about funding. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of Metronet. Yes. Uh, but, uh, geez, our local ALP love to push that as their only fucking policy. Um, so they're, they're getting some funding from that, from uh, Bill, if he gets in charge. Uh, did I mention Metronet? Did, Metronet. Uh, anyone out there? Have you guys heard of Metronet? Yes. <laughs> I've heard of Metronet. I don't quite know what it it's is. It's all they talk about. <laughs> Metronet. Yeah, everything's a metronet. That's my opinion on the local Labour Party. So did we uh, have a winner for tonight's debate? Laura Tingle. <laughs> no, she Fair asked call. the best questions. Yeah, she, I actually, I might, we should write into the ABC and be like, hey, we'd like Tingle to you know, chair the next debate. Yeah. Or maybe participate if that's... Yeah, at least happens. participate. Because <laughs> she had the, she definitely had the best questions. If we can use her as the bar. Yeah. yeah. That's good. I think we're, that would be a winner. Yeah, look, I actually, I'm going to go one step further. I think uh, Shorten did what he needed to do tonight, which was point out that there is a genuine um, reason for change. Malcolm is still peddling the same old, same old. He's basically Tony Abbott in a nicer suit. And people didn't like Tony. They didn't like his policies. 
and Shorten did a reasonable job of pointing that out. He could have been stronger with pointing that out. But I think that he achieved what he set out to achieve. I don't think Malcolm set out really... I don't think Malcolm achieved what he set out, which is to justify continuity with his government. All they did was, like, we've got an economic plan. And as Shorten pointed out, you've had three economic plans in a, in a couple of months. Yeah, I, I think I was all set up to be completely underwhelmed by Bill Shorten, and, and he didn't. He actually came, he went out and did... I was whelmed. Yeah. yeah, I was whelmed. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't overwhelmed. I wasn't underwhelmed. I was whelmed by him. <laughs> yeah, he's not an... I mean, just his He general, managed my expectations going into this. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to like him. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, he, he had to overperform in his content to sort of get that whelming feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he really did. And, and you know, he came out... He, he did come out looking okay from this debate. Certainly, when I go back and I see his performances and what policies presented, I certainly disliked him more back then for the policies he was presenting. But out of this debate, I was... The other thing we talked okay. about during the debate, which we didn't talk about on the show, is was it a tactical decision to wear a cheap suit? <laughs> did he really did he want to make Malcolm look like a rich banker from the high end of town and Bill looks more like an ordinary yeah, working class guy in a, an ordinary suit and I, yeah I, th- I, I think there's the possibility that was that was a, a choice an actual conscious choice yeah because it, it seemed to be obviously ill-fitting at times yeah. and I was I'm just I think it was a tactical choice he makes good money as a politician I'm sure he can afford a decent suit yeah yeah he chooses not to wear it tonight interesting anyway Hmm. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll mention about Malcolm Turnbull was where I felt he was strong was talking about strong economy. You got the message that the Liberal Party is focused on building a strong economy. He also said they're going to do that by trickle down economics. Well, he didn't use those words exactly. No, he alluded but to it. Basically, he is very strong on that side of things, which does resonate with a large segment of the Australian po- popularity. Where he failed was to make a connection with average Australians, I felt. Yeah. He never really talked much about the issues that affect you know, your battling family and what he's going to be doing for them, you know, only tacitly via a strong economy. Yeah, he, yeah. he does have the advantage, though, of being a, a stronger public speaker. Like, when you listen to Malcolm speak, he comes across and sounds like a leader yes. and someone you follow. When you listen to Bill Shorten speak, he comes across as someone who is leading begrudgingly. Like, he doesn't actually want to be the front man, he's just doing it because there's no one else or maybe because he's been pushed into the role, which I don't think is the case at all. I think he's power hungry, but he's not a strong... He's not as strong in front of the camera as Malcolm is. No. Malcolm's very uh, polished on that regard. And that brings us to a, a special event bap. Thank you for listening. I've been Franco. I've been Jason. I am still Dean. And I think you'd look good in Neil Fitting suit, Dean. <laughs> <laughs>